us the opportunity to serve you in all that we do as we come together at this time. Keep us thinking of you always as we later depart after this class and continue in all the work that we do. Let us shine in your light so that others may see your good works through your servant in us. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gary. Go ahead, Chris. Well, we're grateful again that you joined us this week as we continue our study of the Torah. And this week, our Parsha uh, begins in chapter 6, verse 2. It's called Parsha uh, Baera. And it means, and I appeared. And we'll see that in the first verse uh, that we'll read or that we'll look at. That's in verse 2 when God talks about he appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, we looked last week at uh, Moses and his uh, birth and uh, his selection uh, as a prophet and his call to, to go to Egypt. And uh, we're getting to that point where he's uh, been down there and, and he's tried to get some things happening and it's not. And uh, we're going to move into, uh, uh, as we commonly refer to him, the 10 plagues. Uh, and uh, we'll see a few of those, not all of them tonight, but we'll see uh, the bulk of them here as we as we look at our study. But I think verse two is, is pretty good to start, and it's going to kind of ask a question or two, or not, it, the text doesn't ask it, but I think, uh, as we say, it sort of begs the question uh, that, that we'll ask and give Ben a second to, to talk about it. Uh, because God says he spoke to Moses in verse 2 of chapter 6 and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, but I did not make myself known to them by my name. Uh, he established a covenant with them uh, and gave the land to, the Can uh, to give them the land of Canaan and the land in which they were lived as sojourners. I have now heard the moaning of the Israelites because of the Egyptians and I have remembered them. And uh, we want to look at that uh, verse two when it talks about the fact that uh, God uh, had appeared before to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, but had not uh, revealed or did not, not make themself, himself known to them. Uh, and, and sort of what does that mean? Because obviously he did, you know, <laughs> he did talk to them and and uh, we would think that they would know him, but he's, it seems as God's sort of drawing a distinction between how they referred to uh, God and how now he's asking Moses to refer to him or to understand him. Um, and so I just kind of curious, Ben, as, you, as we look at that, sort of what your thoughts are on, you know, how God's choosing to reveal himself to Moses and if his name, the new name that apparently is just now uh, coming into uh coming into existence here for uh, the Israelites is something that we think is new, something that, that shares some different light or insight into who God is and uh, sort of, you know, go from there. Um, well, I mean, one thing, the, the word name, shame in he Hebrew refers to um, the character of a person, <clears throat> not just a designation. And, and we might use it that way when we say like somebody made a name for themselves. Uh, and, and so, and uh, yet this name, um, uh, yod heh vav -He, the tetragrammaton, the four letters, they usually, um, uh, Yahweh maybe, um, is in Genesis 4, the last verse, it says after um, Seth, has a son and calls his name Anosh, then um, men began to call upon the name of yod -Heh Yahweh. And so all the way, way back there at the time of, um, of Seth's son, you have men calling on the name of the Lord. So it's strange here we read, isn't it? And he said that I didn't make myself known to the patriarchs that way. Um, maybe they knew the name, but they, he's going to reveal the, the, uh, a fuller picture of the name. The, uh, the, 
some, the, the rabbis understand this because the last thing we saw in the last parsha <clears throat> was that uh, God told Moses and Aaron, go to Pharaoh and say, let, let the Lord says, let my people go. And he said, who is the Lord? Uh, Adonai. And he's going to get a good education in that through the plagues. But <clears throat> you remember, I think um, Moses and Aaron might have thought, well, this is just going to we'll go in there and say, the Lord said, let my people go and they'll be free. But it gets worse. He makes their work harder. And then they meet the elders of Israel and they say, you know, thanks a lot for what you did for us. It's worse now. Uh, and then Moses questions God. And so the rabbis, as this parsha open, uh, opens, understand that this is somewhat of a rebuke of Moses, that I, I, he spoke to Moses and then he said, I am Adonai, I, I am the Lord, but I appeared to the patriarchs by El Shaddai. Um, let me see if I can find a note here. It says that... Uh, <clears throat> the one uh, Rashi says that God didn't reveal Himself with Adonai because the promises were not fulfilled in in their lifetime, in the patriarchs' lifetime, but they're going to be fulfilled um, in roughly the time of Moses. And so, so I don't think it's the idea they didn't know the name. I think it's the idea that they they didn't know He's going to reveal what this name means, and, and it's based upon the verb to be. Like at the burning bush, yeah, I share it. Yeah, I will be who I will be, and and so what he does, and so in the plagues, I think we see action. What kind of character is God? Well, he's a God of action, and the big contest here is between Yahweh, the God of action, and Pharaoh, who thinks he's in control. And the plagues show that Pharaoh's not in control; God's in control. So. Um, I don't know. That may be all I can say about it. Uh, some people have brought up John 17 and verse 3 in the prayer of Jesus when he says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Well, a lot of people know of the one true God and his son but it's more of a relationship. Who is he? So in this name, I think he's revealing a relationship. Do you think he was sharing something with Moses or he was expecting a relationship, as you said, that would be different than what he had with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as example, or just a new manifestation or something, you know? Yeah, would... because Yahweh is his personal name. Um, El Shaddai is God, uh, what, whatever that may mean, you know, God is self-sufficient or sufficient to others, but this is his personal name in that he is the one who acts. He's, uh, I will be who I will be. And he's going to sh give meaning to the name in the plagues. So he shows himself. Um, yeah, Jimmy, I would, I would say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the patriarchs. Yeah. Well, I guess we could look to see, you know, if that plays out so that, you know, yeah. does God reveal himself in a way that we haven't seen before? Uh, and I think that's and he talks about throughout this of, of, um, doing it with a mighty hand. And um, one, of the, one of the prophets says that he bared his arm. It's almost like rolling up your sleeves in figurative language to get right. to work. And so, and, and the very idea of redemption is that there is a price that's paid, an effort. And the price that God paid in redeeming Israel was the effort that he made in that. And um, I think it was Leon Morris wrote a book. Do you remember the name of that book? Uh, Atonement or the cross? It has something to do with the cross. Yeah. Uh, um, he wrote one called The Atonement, and the other was called The Cross of Jesus. The Apostolic Preaching of the Cross. I think it's in The Cross of Jesus. 
and he explores the word redeem, the Greek word redeem, and then he explores the Hebrew background of that, explores it in the Septuagint. And his idea is that redemption always involves a price that's paid. And so when God redeems Israel, the price is he wrote it figuratively rolls up his sleeves and he goes to work. He's involved in this. And so I think that's maybe uh, some, I mean, he, he worked for Abraham, he worked for Isaac and Jacob, but again, he's revealing himself in a personal way here. I don't know. I, I mean, it's not an easy idea or easy passage. Well, it's interesting as it text moves on it, it again i'm reading from the jewish study bible um sort of re recurring um phraseology uh or, or maybe as you said the might that he will use because uh, i went I, when i read the next couple of verses i it kept saying he's i will do this i will do that and so i highlighted it and he in verse six you know he says tell the israelite people and the lord i will free you I will redeem you. I will take you. I will be your God. I will bring you. I will give it to you. Uh, you know, here's what you're going to tell them. And I, I'm doing all these things. I will do all these things that are, as you said, are very, um, well, I don't want to say it's hard work for God, but as you said, it's maybe more mighty work or maybe it's a, a, a you know, some degree of effort. I, again, I'm not sure how you say that about God, but certainly we would understand it as being mighty acts on his part. Uh, yeah, it is the mighty acts of God. And in those four phrases, however they're translated, I'll bring you out, I'll deliver you, I'll redeem you, or I will take you. Uh, the rabbis understood that as the foundation for the four cups at Pesach, at Passover. Hmm. And those four cups, remember. <clears throat> and they understand this as progressive stages of this redemption in that it's beginning now. And at this point in the text, it's beginning, but we it's not completely fulfilled until they're out of Egypt, going out of Egypt, and even going through the, the uh, Red Sea. So, yeah, it's God's effort in, in doing that. Right. And, I mean, from a theological standpoint, you have such language of uh, the redemption that we have in Christ. And, and that's Morris's point, I think that redemption is not without a cost. Um, it's, see, some people think, uh, I think this is what Morris is saying, is that God forgives because he's God. That's just what God does. <laughs> okay. He, it's almost like he's obligated to do that yeah. because of who he is. But there's a tremendous, like Peter says, you know, you've been redeemed with a price, the precious blood of Christ. Yeah. And Jimmy, I agree with you. I like, you know, I've always been moved by his God's comments. I will be your God and you shall be my people. Right. And I mean, when I think about relationships and what they should truly look like, I mean, that's very reassuring. Um, Sums up a lot. I mean, and it's uh, Israel's relationship with God and it's based in covenant <clears throat> and we are in a covenant relationship as well new covenant and it's you didn't lightly break covenants <laughs> and so that's something i think that we need to keep in mind as well well it the, the people you know god tells moses to go tell the people this and in verse nine when he does it they don't listen uh and again this text reads uh because their spirits were crushed by cruel bondage Right. So it was it was hard to hear what God was saying to them about what will happen, about what will be, because at this moment in time, they felt the burden. They, they couldn't see beyond perhaps just the day that they were living uh, and what they were having to face uh, in order to see how the promises might be. And they have a shortness of breath of Ruach and. Uh... Their spirits were crushed, as translation, and impatience of spirit some people have. 
Um, and it's this crew of bondage. So the crew of bondage hadn't let up. It's even got worse since Moses and Aaron came. And yet at this point, we don't have Moses going to God again and saying, are you sure you want to read, you might want to rethink this whole thing. Um, it's the Lord is just, he's going on Moses and Aaron and he spoke to them and he spoke to Moses and he said, go speak to Pharaoh. And Moses says, "Hey, you listen, the people didn't listen to me. Why you make? What makes you think Pharaoh would?" And yeah, that doesn't matter. You know, the, the Lord spoke to both Moses and Aaron, instructing uh, them to deliver a message. And he brings up the whole idea of uh, uncircumcised lips, which I guess means the idea he's not a he has an obstruction or he's he's not a good speaker. And um, seems like God's already met that objection. And so he's bringing it up again. Maybe the idea is he thought, well, um, Aaron, that, that Aaron's to do that back there. And now I have the whole mission on, on me. Yeah. Sometimes we go back to what we're comfortable with making excuses. And yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's well, look, the next section there really is sort of a, part of a genealogy it's not complete or anything like that but it is uh part of a genealogy we do come across uh amram took his wife took to wife his father's sister jacobed and she bore him aaron and moses and again sort of this idea it's like you know at some point you can get to the to the to scripture where it says you know these ancestral relationships shouldn't exist can't exist but yet Again, at some point, uh, must have been acceptable, or at least uh, was something that was not as um, black and white as it, it soon comes to be. Yeah, I mean, we're at this point now, and, and Scripture doesn't, you know, revise that. Um, Gary says, was God also showing the people he was in charge when the plagues was shown to Pharaoh. So when time came, the people will listen to Moses. Yeah, I mean, Moses is intertwined with God. And we're going to talk about how what happened to the Egyptians uh, seems to not have happened to the Israelites who were in Goshen. Now, sometimes it explicitly says that. Other times, I guess we have to infer it. Uh, but you know they knew it. And, you know, you know they, they knew what was going on. Uh, but yeah, maybe, maybe God was trying to prove to them as well that, that he was their God and they should believe in him. I mean, it's instructive to, to any reader of Torah, and it would be instructive to the audience that Moses is writing to. Um, that um, Because I think fundamental in the plagues is God, like in chapter 12, 12, he says he, he showed judgment on the gods of Egypt. Numbers 33 and verse 4 says basically the same thing. And so if he did that with their gods, then that should be instructive to Israel that I should not have any more gods. Uh, there's one true God. Well, Ben, the, the reason why I brought that up to you and Chris was uh, as I was reading it and listening uh, and, and, and I listen, I, I play my Bible on, on audio so that I can hear. Yeah. And, and I can close my eyes and, and try and put myself in a position. Um, it, it says that the people didn't believe Moses. Yeah. So, so I'm thinking that these plagues were as, as important to the people uh, to, to start understanding that this is God. And God's speaking this way. And, and you need to... Um, step up, realize it, and start taking uh, a strong understanding. But they haven't. They they were like Pharaoh. There was always this this resistance that, uh, and and it's I guess it's a little bit today. You know when when people are are told about Christianity and stuff, uh, there's a resistance. You know I mean I, I can't see God. I can't touch God. You know all of those questions that we've asked before. Yeah. So, so they, to me, they didn't have the faith yet, and and they're going to learn this. It's just going to take some, um, the same education, uh, to them as to Pharaoh. 
And I think the text, yeah, I'd agree with you. And the text points out that uh, the record of the plagues is to show Egypt and Pharaoh that God is in control. He's the one true God, but also to show the Israelites, but also to show the world. And so we're studying it tonight and it's showing us that there's one God and he's completely in control. Rahab sure knew about it, didn't you? I'm sorry? Rahab knew about it. Yes, yes. In Jericho. Yeah, yeah. She's acting more like a uh, like an Israelite than um, a Khan or Achan, who is an Israelite, who acts like a Canaanite. <laughs> you know, but one of the, the whole point is that Jericho knew about Israel. Yes. Not just Rahab, but the whole group knew about Israel. That's right. One of the rabbis I was looking at uh, today sort of called, and I thought about it when Gary was talking because it sort of talks about the ups and downs of life. And I couldn't help but think about, you know, our faith. You know, we believe, help our unbelief. And, you know, we go back and forth. And this rabbi I was talking about the ups and downs. And he said, uh, regarding the Egyptians, when they came to Goshen and lived in prosperity, that was an up. A new king or dynasty arises, begins to persecute the Israelites. That's a down. The birth of Moses and the promise it held was an up. But when all the children were thrown into the Nile, that was a down. When Moses was saved by Pharaoh's daughter, that was an up. When Moses identified himself as his own people and had to flee, that was a down. So, you, you know, in, in this particular rabbi's uh, discussion, it's, it's like we see the vicissitudes of life. You know, we go up and down and we see the faith. And uh, I think we've seen that in our patriarchs for the most part and to varying degrees. And, you know, they have strong faith, but yet then we see them maybe not exhibit strong faith. Uh, we see them believing in God, but then we see them, you know, questioning God. And uh, for me, I find that kind of, again, reassuring when I'm looking for uh help in my own life right and it's it's easy to take a, a the bible and set it on a, a pedestal so to speak and think that everybody in there you know i know we brought rushes like well you know there was that was different then that's something special then then or you know no they were human beings <laughs> you know just like us trying to find their way in life and believe in a god that uh, revealed himself to them in different ways and at different times and uh, i i find that somewhat reassuring yeah it's characteristic of us as you said yeah um, we, we move to chapter seven and again if you want to say anything before then we can uh but i think we get into chapter seven a little bit and we we sort of uh kicked the can last week uh when we started talking about pharaoh's heart being hardened and uh we're going to get into that you know, pretty quickly here in chapter seven, uh, when the Lord tells Moses, see, I place you in the role of God to Pharaoh with your brother Aaron as your prophet. You shall repeat all I command you and your brother Aaron shall speak to Pharaoh to let the Israelites depart from his land. Verse three, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and marvels in the land of Egypt. Now we may look at each one of these as we go through the text, but it it's setting up, uh, it, it, it may be reinforcing because we saw it just a little bit in the last part that, like I said, we, we didn't address, but it's setting up this idea. <laughs> How involved was God in the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, you know, and, and what does that say, if anything, about free will, uh, or is it a, a misunderstanding, or is there a uh, sort of, I don't know, line in the sand, so to speak, that once a person crosses it, I mean, you can look at this at different ways, but obviously this is a, a point that I know I've heard all my life. And sometimes it's just been glossed over. We want to, you know, dismiss it that somehow, well, God's not that type of God. It must be some mistake, or maybe it's just how we're reading it. But I don't know. The more you look at it, it's like, man, that language seems pretty clear. So there's got to be a, doesn't have to be a great explanation, but there must be some better explanation than it's just a misinterpretation. So I, again, look at whatever verses you want to look at, but I, I think that as we read it here in verse three sort of sets this idea up that we're going to see over the next few chapters 
uh, something that we ought to, you know, spend a few moments on, uh, at least setting the ground, setting the stage, laying the groundwork. Yeah, I mean, when we get to this, this, uh, this is something I always you have to discuss this, and uh, it um, it caused problems with rabbis and with Jewish people because they strongly believe in free will. Um, they there is a rabbinic saying that says everything is in the hand of God except the free will of humans, and so. Um, free will is here. In fact, the rabbis say the difficulty is that if God hardened Pharaoh's heart, how could he justly be condemned for his refusal? Um, and it, it's not easy thing here, but I think maybe a couple of things might help us in thinking about it. One is there's not one, just one verb that's used throughout for hardening. There are several that are used. Uh, the one that's used here in 7.3 means to make hard or severe or fierce. And God says, I'll do this. In the Hebrew, there is the I is emphatic. I, I, I myself will do this. And he's already told Moses at the burning bush about this as well. Um, I know that he, he won't let you go. His heart will be hardened. Um, another verb that's used in, um, so I can't find exactly the, the rep, one of the references is throughout, but it's a verb that means to strengthen. And so the idea is God is saying, I will strengthen Kazakh. I will strengthen his heart. In other words, I'll strengthen his resolve. Now, one thing that stands out, it's only after the sixth plague that it says specifically that God himself hardens Pharaoh's heart. He says he will do it here, but then in the references that follow, it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. So you have Pharaoh hardened his heart. In 713, it says his heart was hardened. And we don't know, we won't have a subject there. Who hardened his heart? I guess, presumably, he hardened his heart. It reminds me of a reference in, I think it's Luke, where it talks about um, the uh, disciples didn't recognize Jesus and uh, because their eyes were blinded. It doesn't say who blinded their eyes. Um, is God blinding their eyes or is Satan blinding their eyes? It, do it doesn't say. So it doesn't say in 713 who is hardening the heart. But in places, it does say Pharaoh hardened his heart. So we have the idea of the heart being strengthened or the heart being made fierce and hardened. Then there's another verb that's used. And this is really interesting, I think. And it's a verb that means it's kavod. And it's a verb that means to be heavy. And it's often translated in the, in the Hebrew scriptures of glorify. God is glor to be glorified because he's it's he's thought of as heavy if you think lightly of god then that's not giving him the proper place but pharaoh's heart is made heavy and some have suggested in egyptian thought like in the book of the dead there is a, a, a painting of what the egyptians thought happened after life and it was like after you died then there was a reckoning and your heart was placed on one side of the scale and a feather was placed on the other side of the scale. And if your heart weighed more than a feather and it didn't go well for you, and what made your heart heavy was that you didn't treat people right and you, you know, just a bad person. And so they thought if you, you know, were a bad person and you died, then your heart becomes heavy. Now, I don't, I don't know, you know, whether it's, in, it's intended to have the same idea here, but just imagine Egyptians hearing the idea of the heart is made heavy. But it's, yeah, I think it's, uh, Pharaoh has his free will, and then God says, okay, well, you've had your chance. I, I confirm you in that. I'll let you have your free will. You, you've denied me, and so he strengthens him in that. And his heart becomes heavy. Could he, it's, it's the idea, I mean, could he have, could he have repented? Yes, if his heart had been right. It's not that God is saying, I'm not going to let you repent. It's that he's at a point where he cannot repent. 
It's impossible, like the writer of Hebrews, impossible to renew them to repentance. That that's my understanding. Well, I mean, it, the Pharaoh, uh, not just this Pharaoh, but all all of them. I mean, in, correct me if I'm wrong, but in some ways, their their life, um, while not necessarily monotheistic, was wrapped up very heavily in. Uh, their belief in their gods and what the gods were doing in their daily lives. Uh, we're going to look at the Nile uh, and, and what the blood, uh, the water turning to blood and, and why that's significant. And, and as you said earlier, God uh, is sort of showing in some ways, as he does in other places, that, that he's a bigger God than their gods, right? Because these are not just insignificant things that happen. Uh, and, and the, the Nile itself you know, being a, a, a deity in its own way, the sun and all these sorts of things, uh, you know, God showing his power over uh, these other uh, gods. Even the Pharaoh himself viewed himself as a deity. Yeah. And so um, some of the rabbis even said that when, you know, Moses and Aaron meet him at the, at the Nile and announcing these plagues, and some of the rabbis, and this is just something they made up, but they say that since he was given the impression that he was a god, uh, gods don't have to relieve themselves. And so he would slip off to the Nile in the morning to do that. And then all of a sudden you look up and you see Moses and Aaron and they're going to, you know, if you don't listen to God, this is going to happen. But uh, the, the pharaohs did view themselves as gods and the Nile is God. And so... And underlying all this whole hardening of the heart probably is that. Um, can't see who wrote this about God fighting and defeating the Egyptian. That's Jimmy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, he is a, a man of war. So well, tell me why Judas was selected as an apostle. There had to be someone to betray Jesus Christ. It's not that God forced him to do that, but God knew what he would do. And his heart was very hard when he went in and made a deal with the uh, chief priests. And he came back and threw the money in the temple, the naos. He thoroughly repented, but then went and hanged himself. Yeah, I mean, he had the free will. And, um, and God, uses, God uses free will of humans to bring about his ultimate purpose. Um, and so... God didn't force him to do that. He chose to do that. Um, he seems to have been tempted by the money bag. And John has the idea that he he carried them. He lifted the money bag, carried the money bag, but he really lifted the money bag. <laughs> Stole from the money bag. He's pilfering from the money bag. So um, I I would be a you know a little afraid of somebody who says that they have figured out the sovereignty of God. Yes. Um, Thank you. Because God is God, but scripture does uphold the free will of humans and the sovereignty of God. Probably um, our perspective of reading scripture, we might not appreciate his sovereignty as much as the free will of humans. You know, uh, in chapter nine, verse 12, I guess that's the first time it says, but the Lord Yahweh hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Yeah. And to that time, it had been hardened or he had hardened it. And I think the time came when he was so ridiculous that God, that God, now this is James Andrews talking. I don't know Hebrew, but God said, you know, you've gone far enough now, I'll just take the rest away. I'm going to harden your heart. Uh, I think God did have a part in hardening Pharaoh's heart. Yeah, well, I mean, he plainly says it. And, and we could understand that verb there. That's kazakh. That means strengthened. And so the Lord strengthened the heart of Pharaoh. What's he been doing? He's been rejecting the Lord. And so the Lord strengthened him in that resolve. In that rejection. In that you'd, rejection. Have look at, you'd have to look at that almost though, as, as God then casting judgment upon Pharaoh, because do we ever expect after that to happen that Pharaoh's ever going to repent? Right. And so, uh, is at that moment his free? Does he still have the free will up until the, the last time to change his mind? If not, you know God's being pretty heavy-handed here to stiffen or harden his heart to the point that uh, he's not changing it. 
Uh, and so, but he's had six plagues. Um, he's had. I mean, God said, "I could, I could send one plague and destroy Egypt. The the ten plagues come out of the grace of of God, I think, as instruction in His grace. But it's at at what point, you know, do we keep turning away from the grace of God and turning away? So yeah, God does have a hand in it, and that's the difficult part of it. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's the that's the point is what at what point do we turn away and what point does God take it away? Because uh, I get very easily the point that we turn away from God's grace. Yeah, uh, it becomes harder to. And it's just the whole point of this discussion that why well, it's been agonized over it becomes harder to see that God takes away that grace, uh, even as bad as Pharaoh is and even any chances he's given. Uh you know, if Jesus trying to tell, you know, Peter 70 times seven, yeah. uh, you know, okay. Uh, it's supposed to be unlimited, but anyway, and that may have something to do with God's foreknowledge. And, um, and again, it may be the nature of the issue. I mean, you can take Plato that's pliable and you can make something and then you can, you don't like what you made. You can, start over but if you put it out in the sun it it bakes it where now you cannot it's not pliable so it may be the nature of that um well it may be and and that uh you know that is a good introduction to as we look at these and i I think the the uh, flip side to that because again we're talking about a belief in god and and uh, understanding him as the true god um, this might be a good time again because we see it happening at least the first few plagues before the magic runs out uh, to, to maybe talk about this idea of just how much power did uh, and what did it look like to be a magician uh, in Egypt at this time and what was their role and um, it says they at least for the first couple of three they could do these same seemingly do these same uh, miracles Uh, which contributed to Pharaoh saying, hey, I don't know who you are, but uh, I'm not impressed. And so not letting the people go. Uh, But but what was uh, what was sort of, you know, magic like? What was the expectation of of the Egyptian magicians uh, during this period of time? Um, Well, you know, and throughout this, I think Pharaoh has the idea that Moses and Aaron are just magicians and that's why like you know when he says i can't remember what plague it is it's one of the ones we're studying when um he says uh, please ask the lord that it stop and then moses says i will give you the ple- the honor of telling me when it uh, god should stop it and he says tomorrow and as i read as i read that i think if i'm in the middle of the plague why am i going to say tomorrow why not just right now right now yeah um and it may be that he is testing moses and he thinks well he's just kind of playing on some things that have circum uh, coincidences that have worked out here and um rashi uh, says that um that Pharaoh said to Moses, have you brought magic to Egypt, the world's hotbed of magic? And so, I mean, there's a long history of of magic in in Egypt. And by magic, I mean, related in the ancient world is is magic, religion, and uh, healing or medicine. Hmm. And those people would have high standings in society. And I think that's what it means when the magicians are struck with that plague of boils and they can't stand before Moses and Pharaoh. They're embarrassed because they should handle such things as that. But, you know, I guess the big question, and I don't have the answer, you know, are they really doing anything or are they just giving the impression that they're doing something? Where, where is the, um, it, so the one you referenced was the frogs. That was in chapter eight, as uh, Amy was pointed out. Uh, and that's the one that they try to do and can't do. Well, that was the one that they uh, where Pharaoh was pleading to let it let oh, them go. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, okay, the next day. One more uh, night with the frogs. Yeah, that's right. Um, 
the, they bring the frogs, don't they? Are the magicians able to bring the frogs? But the they lice or the them. gnats, they could not. And so this is it's a little bit difficult because the Hebrew in, um, in the English 7, chapter 7 ends with, chapter, with verse 25. And the English begins in 8 1. Well, the Hebrew has 726 down to 729. So it throws the verse numberings off a little bit. But in chapter 8 and verse 6, well, that's the frog. In chapter 8 and verse 14, or verse 18, the magicians did so with their secret arts to bring forth these lice or gnats but they could not. When it says they did so, it says they did thus. And it's the same particle that's used when they do do something. And so they did, they did this, but then it says they couldn't do it. So, um, you know, there's the question about, are they really doing this or are they just giving the impression of, of doing this? And there are arguments on both sides of this. Um, there's, um, like the, uh, the snake that turns into a staff and, or a staff that turns into a snake. Uh, there's an inscription in Egypt I saw in a book somewhere. And there is a cobra, supposedly. I haven't tried this, but uh, <laughs> you can hold him behind the neck and it temporarily paralyzes the, the snake. And it's brown and it looks like a, a rod. And then some, this some suggest they were doing that and then they throw it down on the ground and it comes out of its temporary paralysis. Um, so th there's a long history of magic in Egypt. So something like this, right? I mean, it doesn't seem to be just sleight of hand trickery type of stuff. I mean, I, mean, I, I think a sleight of hand is being someone with a card trick or, you know, something up, you know, the, with some small coins or something that uh, we, we understand slide of hand, but how, how would they even be able to, uh, to do something as broadly as this, as, as, I mean. Well, again, you know, maybe it was the great lighting in the palace or whatever. And, and I'm not arguing for that. I'm just saying, you know, um, there's a, there's an ancient uh, Egyptian, uh, trick that uh, was chopping the head off one rooster, colored rooster, and then chopping the head off another rooster and switching the heads. And then both roosters jump up and, and walk off. And they have writings about that. And, um, you know, it's, did that really happen? Well, it, it, somebody thought it happened. It's, it's like the Indian rope trick there's always there, there's all kind of writings about people who said they've seen the Indian rope trick, but you you start tra chasing it down and it's almost like well I, I have a cousin who had a cousin who was there and they saw it and all that. There's really nobody that you know, and that might have been something like that. And again, I'm not arguing for that, but I'm saying it could be a possibility here that they're just giving the impression whatever they get to a point where they realize that what Moses and Aaron are doing is the finger of God. Yeah. Um, now the other possibility is um, that they're actually doing these things. And we have to ask the question, um, how are they doing them? And um, you know, some would suggest by demonic power. Um, and again, I don't have all the answers to that, you know, you do have um, in New Testament times, you know, about uh, people running around doing different things and, and demons possessing people. So Paul mentions two men, uh, John S. and Yambres, um, who oppose Moses, he says in 2 Timothy 3, verse 8. And um, that might be some of these magicians. So uh, I wrote a paper on this one time. I can't, I guess probably if... Uh, now, if I were to speak on it, I might should go back and see what what grade I got on that paper. But <laughs> yeah. uh, I wrote a paper in grad school on the magicians of Egypt because I, I haven't 
kind of interest in that because I'm interested in, in performing magic. So either they did it or they didn't do it and gave the impression that they did it. Really? Yeah. Yes. Is it, is it possible that God did that for them and then Moses and Aaron's snake ate their snake? I, yeah, it's is that, possible. Is it's that really considered possible. by anybody? Yes, yes, that God's working in this. But, you know, again, that's almost like God setting them up. Uh, but they fell into it if they believe in all that kind of stuff. I mean, and there's a difference between, you know, performing magic as entertainment and what they were believing in. It's tied in with religion. It's tied in with medicine. It's, it's tied in with... Because you have all these gods and you want to control the gods and you can't trust the gods. And so you need incantations, um, cartoon and, and names that you write and all kind of stuff like that. So all that's tied in together. I'm certainly not an expert on Egyptian magic. Well, I, thanks, James. I, again, we're, you know, I knew, I, I knew that this would, we'd start be running out of time sooner than later. And, um, uh, I, I kind of want to ask or talk about this One thing, idea real quick of on the snakes on the rods and the snakes here, just real quick. Right. Um, the general word for snake is used and that's the same thing back there at the burning bush in verse nine of chapter seven, when he says, take the rod, cast it down for Pharaoh and it become a serpent. That word is not the general word for snake. That's the word tanin. And tanin occurs nine times in the Hebrew scriptures. And most of those times it has, it's referring to a larger reptile than a snake. Now, I don't know if that's what that means here, but uh, even some rabbis have suggested it's not snakes here that, that we're talking about. It's talking about maybe like crocodiles or alligators or larger reptiles, but... Um, I don't know. It's my strange that that word is used. Do what? My crocodile is bigger than your crocodile. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. All right. Sorry no. about that. I just threw that out. No, that's good. I, I, again, for I, whatever you want to talk about up to this point, but I, I, I'm thinking about our time's sake here. Yeah. I, I did, did kind of want to sort of see the progression of uh, Pharaoh. So on the one hand, he stiffens his own heart. And then at some point after the, the sixth plague, uh, we're going to see that God stiffens or hardens Pharaoh's heart. But we also see uh, during this same time that Pharaoh, uh, and you mentioned just a few minutes ago, does ask Moses to plead for him on his behalf, right? So he does that in chapter eight uh, with the frogs, plead with the Lord and, and you can go sacrifice. And then Moses actually, you know, what time do you want to do it? As we talked about, do it tomorrow. And, uh, then you have uh, other times at the end of, uh, close to the end of chapter eight, verse 24, I'll let you go sacrifice, but do not go very far. Plead then for me. Uh, so again, uh, you have Pharaoh, asking uh, Moses to plead on behalf of God. Uh, but we get to, uh, we get to the chapter nine. Uh, and, and this is uh, after the hail struck down uh, the, the, the crops in the field and also man and beast. And it's the first time that seemingly that uh, an individual has died. Uh, and so that sets Moses calling for, I mean, it says Pharaoh calling for Moses and Aaron. And he actually says, I stand guilty. Yeah. The Lord is in the right and I'm in the wrong. Plead with the Lord. Uh, so that there may be an end to this thunder and hail. I know you want to talk about thunder a little bit, which I did think was interesting. But I, I, I want to get to this part in verse 30. But Moses tells, I know that you and your courtiers, your court, do not yet fear the Lord. Right. So on the one hand, you've got Pharaoh asking for Moses to plead on his behalf. At some point you have Pharaoh, but then Moses, 
I'm obviously speaking through God is saying, yeah, but you don't fear me yet. Uh, and I kind of want to talk about that idea of fearing the Lord and, and the progression of Moses, uh, the progression of Pharaoh's heart here and, and what he says and, and what comes across in the text is somewhat sympathetic you know, on the, on the, on somewhat of a surface that, Hey, he is saying, I plead for plead to your God. He may not believe in God. Like we are ourselves, but he is saying, you know, plead to your God, uh, make all this go away. And then I'm guilty and, and you're right. So what are your thoughts there sort of surrounding again, in light of the fact that we see God hardening his heart uh, more and more after check after the sixth plague. Yeah, I mean, after the sixth plague, it says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. But then you talk about, you know, it, at times he'll say, please relent and ask the, and treat the Lord. And then that passage in 927, he says that uh, I have sinned. I acknowledge my sin. And he even also says um, the Lord, he uses the, the term Yahweh. He uses the term we've been talking about. The Lord is righteous. Now, you know, right, you have to define righteous in context. Is he saying the Lord's right? Um, and I and my people are wicked. And so reading that, that sounds like, you know, well, okay, things have changed. He's been, you know, six plagues have hit him and that's where he's at. Um, and yet, then as you brought out that Moses says, uh, I'll, I'll pray for you and I'll pray that, or I'll pray that this plague is uh, lifted and that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But in then verse 30, as for you and your servants, I know that you will um, either not yet fear the Lord. And, and some understanding of this is that, um, that he's saying before I spread my hands in, in prayer, um, you and your servants fear God. But as soon as the relief comes, then you're right back to where you were. And, and so it has the impression, I mean, is he sincere? The impression is, well, Moses doesn't think he's sincere. So it reminds me of like, you remember when Saul offered the sacrifice, he was, was not supposed to sacrifice and Samuel confronted him. And then he says, uh, please, I'm, I'm, I'm I've sinned, and, but then you follow Saul's life, and you know, next thing you know, he's rejecting God's word and going trying to get a word from the dead and everything else. So that's the impression I get is that it's 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 almost like um, the difference between regret or remorse and repentance. Like you know, I, uh, somebody may be involved in some wrongdoing, and then they get caught. Well, I'm sorry I did that. Well, of course you are. You got caught. Um, and that can lead to repentance, but it doesn't have to, you know, once the consequences are lifted, it may not have an effect. So I don't know. I don't know the full answer to this, at this point. Ben, there's not a preacher alive that hasn't had that feeling when some people have made a public confession. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's not really up to me, you know, to, to, question them That's we can't point. we can't judge it but we can feel it yeah um yeah but we judge people all the time yeah i mean you you i know we say that but we're looking back and i know we have the benefit of looking at pharaoh here and having god you know through moses interpret it and, and understand it. but but we look at i mean we we see people and we want to judge people and we say we don't but but we do and we all we find some if we feel like they're not fully repentant, whatever that means by our own definition, that, well, then they, they don't really believe or they didn't really ask for forgiveness or they're not really repentant. Uh, and, and I think that's, that, that complicates this story because yeah. on the one hand, as we've, as we've discussed, and I, you know, I'm not trying to make more out of it than it is, but uh, I can see where this story gets more complicated. And in fact, you've got God hardening his heart right to the point that that there seems to be no question that god is is personally involved in it but yet you hear words from pharaoh that he and, and remember what i think is interesting i didn't realize it until you just said it we started this passage off 
with God saying that he was going to reveal himself in a way that he had not revealed to the patriarchs concerning his name and who he is and his character. And Pharaoh himself, maybe when the Israelites weren't, Pharaoh himself is calling God by his personal name. Yeah. Right. And so he's there's some acknowledgement that he sees God as Yahweh. Uh, and he's saying these right things. And yet Moses says, yeah, but I know you don't fear yet. And it's like, OK, maybe he doesn't. And maybe, again, God showed him that, told him that. And, you know, but for me, it's like it's one more one more instance where, you know, if we're not careful, we find one more reason to to make someone strive a little bit harder, do a little bit something else, see it a certain way uh, that that is, we don't have the right to do that. Uh and if we're looking to change people's hearts and change them toward God, then uh, we're sharing God's word with it. But then are we adding burdens? And we talked about what the, you know, we see what the Pharisees did, you know, and adding more <laughs> yoke to the, to the Jews, to the people at that time and their rebuke for it. Uh, and I'm just wondering again, you know, uh, how this, how this plays out. Now, again, we see that Pharaoh hardens his heart, becomes stubborn at the end of the chapter uh, and reverts to his guilty ways. Uh, but I mean, if he really meant what he said, I, I have sinned, the Lord is righteous, Yahweh is righteous. Yeah. At that moment, that'd be the end of the plagues because he would say, I've sinned, let all the Israelites go. Open the gates and let, and let them go. But he doesn't. But again, maybe the idea is um, when it says the Lord hardened his heart, he strengthened him in his resolve, but his resolve is dependent on whether the pressure's on him or the pressure's off. And when the pressure, you know, is on him, and then it's, if you get this off of me, you know, I've sinned, and then, but then when the pressure is taken off, we're back to verse 35 of chapter 9, his heart was hard. He didn't let the Israelites go. It's like that old story of the guy who's out two miles from the edge of the ocean, edge, edge of the of the, the sand, and, you know, he thinks he's going to drown. God, if you'll save me, I'll do everything you want. And as he gets closer to land, and, you know, he, he doesn't remember God anymore. He's like, boy, yeah. I got myself back here on my own. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I think that's a challenge for us right i mean yeah. you just described the whole life that paul talks about in romans as well right you know our bodies do certain things we don't want them to do and i try to do the right thing but don't and you know i end up and i think you know i don't know if it's the pressure how we see it or uh you know if it's response to our own conviction that we're not living as we should and that and that's the that's the pressure that comes but you know for me the the question is, I don't want to revert to my old ways, right? If I truly have repented, if I truly am changing my life, if I've dedicated myself to God, then mm -hmm. the worst thing that can happen to me is that, well, whenever that guilt or whenever that uh, change of heart, you know, happens, that somehow I revert back to my old ways uh, because somehow I feel like I don't have to worry uh, about anything or I've gotten God on my side now and all things, it's all going to be okay. Uh but, you know, to, we talked about, you know, it, it, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, uh, and the fear of Jacob, yeah. right? This idea that, that, that that's where God was used, the name of fear. And I'm just kind of wondering if, if there's, as we talked about, what does that really mean? Is it the awe? Is it the uh, respect? Is there something to that? And it, it, to me, Moses is sort of saying, you don't fear the Lord. You don't fear God's the way we that, that, that you're called to. Uh, yeah, you know, anyway, it's just interesting. Yeah, you don't yeah. reverence him. Ooh. And the idea of, um, I mean, um, it's the direct, like John would present it, the direction of a person's life. Um, Moses is going to sin and he's going to not give God the glory. Um, yet it's the direction of a life. At this point, Pharaoh's direction of life is just uh, anything I can do to get out of this bad situation that I'm in. And uh, I think Moses rightly recognizes that. I mean, if he really meant it, then Moses wouldn't have had to go into anything and, you know, was, we're okay, we're leaving. But um, it is interesting. God hardens his heart and then he says, I've sinned. 
Uh, and then at the end, the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. Chris, the point I was making a while ago on the, the preacher's gut, it was his gut. It was not his interaction with the person who made a public confession. Yeah. It's a gut yeah. feeling. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Well, look, we've uh, con been through another hour of the day and uh, – I don't know about you, but time passes quickly in these discussions and uh, appreciate everybody's comments and uh, and uh, your patience and putting up with uh, our just open discussion. I mean, uh, sometimes we don't know which way it's right going. Way. Yeah, you don't. And then, and then there's just, I think it's a good forum just to, to ask questions that maybe we don't ask often or look at things that, in a way that we don't, uh, we don't always look at them and, um, you know, we might come across something new and see a different light, or we might be reinforced what we already knew, but uh, we don't, I, I think we don't often, this is one of the things I like about talking with Ben, and we don't often just get a chance to kind of say, I don't know, and then here's what it is, and I wonder about this, and I wonder about that, and does that change how we see things, or make it more rich, uh, which I like to think about it, it makes it a little bit more rich in how we see God's word, and um, beyond just the stories of the 10 plagues, and uh, and, and the people coming out of Egypt. So I appreciate uh, everybody's participation. And Ben, thank you for what you're sharing. And um, yeah, I like what you. you're doing. I thank you. Yeah, we appreciate you all. Appreciate Chris and the work that, he, that he's doing. So, uh, and again, as I, I probably say this every week, I, I know, uh, you know, most of you may work all day and then you, you uh, tune into this and we appreciate that. And, uh, we don't have all answers. Um, we study scripture in community. And uh, I mean, these are ancient texts and, and people have been wrestling with these for a long, long time. And so we enter into that stream. And I think there are things that, that we can learn. And I think God works in that as well. Uh, it's open heart as we seek to know more about God. Um, anything anybody else needs to say? All right. Well, we're going to let you go. We're going to ask Jimmy if he will to lead the closing prayer. And uh, thanks again. We'll see you next week. Jimmy. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for all that you do for us. For all of the physical blessings that we receive, you take care of us and you provide for us. May we always be thankful for these blessings and, and be content with what we have. But most importantly, Father, we're thankful for those spiritual blessings. Thank you for your beautiful word, your word that was made flesh and, and your son Jesus dwelt among us, that he was willing to give himself and to provide salvation for us. May we always desire, Father, to study your word, to grow each day, to worship you, to love you, to keep your commandments, and to love and forgive each other. Thank you for Brothers Ben and, and Chris and for our class and for the desire we all have to learn more about you. And we pray your, your blessings on us as we continue to work to study your word. May we always be prepared, all who teach and preach, to provide an answer to anyone who would ask us of that hope we have in Jesus to defend the faith and to use scripture to do so, Father, and do this in love. Thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for Jesus. And it's through his holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jimmy. Everybody Thanks, have Jimmy. a good week. See you later.